welcome to the Nacha Healy Show. Keep it Nacha. We are the Nacha Healy Show. Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. While you're there, Find out more about the Natural Healing Show, which is part of UK Health Radio, your global feel-good radio. Now, our guest today is Beverly Ingle. Beverly Ingle is a psychotherapist, international expert on child abuse, and author of Freedom at Last. You can find out more about Beverly e. Ingle at her and her wonderful work at two websites, beverlyingle.com and also healyourshame.com. Welcome, Beverly Ingle. Hi, thank you. So Beverly Ingle, according to your book, Freedom at Last, you feel that shame is the most damaging result of childhood sexual abuse. Why do you feel that way? Well, primarily because it, it, damages the child in two major ways. Um, there's a pervasive feeling, emotional feeling of being unworthy, of being defiled, of being damaged, of being unlovable. And that becomes a belief within the child. And as the child grows up, they continue to have that belief. And so you can imagine that it affects their personal relationships, their ability to learn in school, their ability to connect with other people, um, their body image, um, their sense of self. It, it just affects everything about them. So that's primarily why it's the most damaging. Uh, it's also damaging in terms of, um, it almost can affect the person in terms of creating their personality. Uh, there are two extremes. One is the person who feels shame and you can even see it in their body posture. They, they're they slumped over. They they feel like they want to hide. They're, they don't come forward as much in, in conversations. They're kind of hiding in the corner. Uh, and then there's the opposite extreme, and that's the person who puffs themselves up, and they stand very erect, almost in a military way. And they're very rigid. And uh, they don't let any in any criticism or any comment, negative comments. They push that away. And those are the two extremes uh, in terms of a creation of a, of, a, of a personality. So it affects the person in multitudes of ways, but those are the primary ways. Beverly Ingle, Ingle absolutely fabulous and really compassionate, heartfelt insights. As a medical intuitive healer, I feel everyone needs healing work on I'm good enough the way I am. I am lovable. <laughs> I am whole and complete as I am. And it's my observation that one of the traps of the self-improvement industry is when people feel like they're not good enough or that they're damaged goods or there's something wrong with them, you keep on this endless cycle of trying to fix yourself rather than going, I'm lovable just the way I am. I'm good enough yeah. just the way I am. Yeah. Someone who's been sexually abused, you're talking a foreign language to them. They have no idea what you're talking about, that, that they're good enough or that they're lovable. They, you could, they could go to 100 seminars and, be, and hear those words 100 times and it would not affect them. Uh, the damage is so deep and especially the damage to their self-esteem. Yes, I agree with you. And, and it goes past the emotional, past the mental, all the way to the soul level, I find. Yes, yes. Now, in your experience, what is shame? How can you describe that for our audience? 
Well, it's it's that pervasive feeling that I described, that pervasive feeling of being inadequate, of being less than. Um, it's an emotional reaction uh, that just makes them feel like they want to hide. The person wants to hide. They feel like, you know, they don't even deserve to be on this earth. They feel dirty. They feel damaged. Um, so that's the emotional reaction. And then there's the belief system that's connected to it. The belief is I'm irreparably, irreparably harmed. I'm inadequate. So it's the a, a feeling, an emotion of wanting to hide and, and feeling inadequate. And it's the belief system attached to that, that I'm, that I'm less than other people. Fabulous explanation. Now, I understand that you have a program that you recommend for recovery from child sexual abuse that you describe in your book, Freedom at Last. What are the major components of the program that you recommend for recovery from child sexual abuse? Well, the first and most probably most important step is to face the truth. And what I mean by that is um, there's a lot of obstacles in the way of, of victims facing what happened to them. First of all, if it was someone that you love or you respect, it's very hard to come to terms with that. Um, you don't want to believe that somebody who loved you would do that to you. And so um, it's very common for victims to blame themselves. That's major. Uh, children, as we know, kind of blame themselves for everything anyway. Like if their parents get a divorce, it's their fault. Um, it's kind of how children think because their brain's not developed enough. Um, but people who are sexually abused almost always feel like they're at fault. They shouldn't have been if at that place. They shouldn't have been with that person. Um, they should have been able to fight the person off. They should have been able to run away. Uh, so they blame themselves. They, they may even believe they entice the perpetrator. Uh, perpetrators are, are masters at manipulation and they can convince the child that the child enticed them, that the child was at fault. So um, there's the denial that it happened because somebody that loved me wouldn't do this. There's the self-blame. And then there's memory issues. When someone is sexually abused, they often dissociate. That means that they actually can leave their body it's a survival instinct. Uh, they leave their body and, and survivors have talked about being on the ceiling, looking down at themselves. They're not even present. Um, and that's fortunate because that helps them survive. But unfortunately, it affects their memory. If you're not in your body, you're not going to remember in the same way we think of a memory to be. Uh, we're not going to remember maybe the the bodily reactions. Uh, we're not going to remember exactly what happened, who did what to whom, or what you were asked to do. Um, it all may be very vague and fuzzy. And so it's hard to believe memories like that and easy to uh, negate them, easy to say, well, I don't want to accuse this person falsely. I'm not really sure. I don't really have a memory of it. I just have this vague feeling and they can't trust that vague feeling. So uh, there's all these obstacles in the way of facing the truth. So that's one of the biggest, biggest steps is to find a way to face the truth. And I suggest that they start a truth book, like a journal where they write down exactly what they do remember. And it may not be the details of the abuse. It may be what, led up to it. It may be how they felt afterwards. It may be how they feel today in the presence of that person. It may be that they get triggered every time they watch a movie that has sexual abuse in it. There may be all kinds of hints that they're not aware of or they're not respecting. So to write those down and then as they continue working, they can go back and read that book and be reminded of what they wrote down and that will help them to get to the place where they trust themselves, where they trust the memories they have, the trust the feelings they have. So that's step number one. Um, step number two is to 
acknowledge the feelings and the suffering that they had because of the abuse. And that's that again can be difficult. Um, it's difficult to connect the dots sometimes. You know, I have sexual issues. You know, I'm turned off to sex. Uh, you know, I kind of feel queasy and sick to my stomach when I even think about sex. Uh, I don't want to have sex at all. Or I've been very promiscuous ever since I was a teenager. And I have a lot of shame about being promiscuous. Um, you know, I've been unfaithful to my husband or my wife. Um, you know, I have these sexual fantasies constantly. I'm constantly masturbating. Um, so writing down those things too, writing down those symptoms that you that you experience can help with the truth, but it also can help with facing the consequences of what happened, connecting the dots and saying, okay, I understand now that the reason I'm promiscuous is because I was sexually abused. So those are the first two steps. I don't know if you want me to continue. Absolutely. <laughs> I, you're so helpful. So what are the other steps after facing the truth and acknowledging your feelings? Yeah. And it's really important to, to connect with your feelings. And uh, since you may have a habit of dissociating, victims of sexual abuse often continue dissociating throughout their life when they're uncomfortable. They don't even have to be reminded you know, of the sexual abuse. It may be something else connected to it and they dissociate. So they're not in their body often. So connecting to your feelings also includes even finding out what your feelings are. And I have an exercise called a check-in where the person just sits quietly, takes some deep breaths, and they go through the, these four major feelings, anger, sadness, fear, and shame slash guilt. And they simply ask themselves one by one, starting with anger, am I angry? and they go inside. That's very hard. That's a very hard concept for some people to get, but practicing it, you can get it. Go inside and ask yourself, am I angry? And feel, have a sense of whether or not you have any anger in you. Uh, and you just continue then with sadness, fear, guilt, and shame. And then the second part of the exercise is to complete the sentence, I'm angry because, and complete that several times without thinking too much just write it down it doesn't have to pertain to the sexual abuse it may just be i'm angry that that guy cut me off on the freeway or i'm angry at my husband but just identifying the emotion of anger is important and then you identify sadness i'm i feel sad because i feel afraid because i feel guilty shame because this is the beginning of the exercise but the point of it is to help you connect with your body, help you connect with your emotions, which for people who were who have been traumatized is really important because they're often numb, they're often dissociated, they often don't know what they're feeling. So that's part of that second step in terms of connecting with your feelings. Um, a third step then is to stop blaming yourself <laughs> and get angry. And those two things are connected. The more you can allow yourself to get angry at the perpetrator or angry at the people who allowed it to happen, that can be equally important, um, the less you're going to blame yourself. Uh, and that's, so that's really important. Victims are very often afraid to get angry. They may have been raised in a household where there was a lot of anger, a lot of violence, and they don't want to be like that. So they're afraid that if they get a little bit angry, they're going to become angry like they're angry hot, angry uh, father or whatever, but they can start to get give, give themselves permission to get angry. And there's lots of safe ways. You can just kneel down beside your bed and hit your bed with your fists. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's as simple and as difficult for, as that because you gotta get your, give yourself permission to express that anger. Um, then the next step is to tell someone that's another really important one. Um, most survivors don't tell someone. They're so ashamed. They're, they feel so bad about themselves. Um, it would feel like they're confessing rather than reporting if they tell someone. Um, so they have to be really careful who you, who you tell. Um, 
maybe your best friend or your partner, if you're in a very good relationship, those are the right kind of people to tell. Uh, it's not usually good to go to your family right away, especially if the perpetrator was a relative, uh, because the family will often support the perpetrator, will often, you know, deny what happened. Um, and then you'll feel horrible. So family members are not the first on the list. Uh, choose somebody who is compassionate, uh, who seems to understand about who victims are and what sexual abuse is, somebody who's fairly educated in those areas. Uh, certainly don't choose somebody that you've heard say things like, oh, she's there she is with a, having a pity party or, you know, there's no such thing as a victim. You know, we choose what happens to us. Um, anybody who has belief systems like that, those are not good people to tell because those people are victim blaming, okay? It's very, very common to blame the victim, you know, in our culture, in all cultures. Uh, it's easier for the person to blame the victim than to allow themselves to feel compassion for the victim um, and to acknowledge that this horrible crime com is, is committed. Because if they acknowledge that, then they have to acknowledge that they are not always in control, that something could happen to them. If there are victims in the world, that means I could be a victim. And I don't ever want to see myself as a victim. So I'm going to have a belief system around there are no victims. We choose everything. It's always the other. It's always the victim's fault. Uh, they could have done something different. And a person like that is not going to have compassion for a victim of, of child sexual abuse. They're, they're, they're going to push away what that person is saying. So you've got to choose your person carefully that you tell. If you're in a group, certainly that's a safe place. If you're a group, in a group for survivors uh, or if you're in therapy uh, or if you're seeing an, a, a, an intuitive, someone who's compassionate, who understands how victims feel, th those are the right people to tell. But it's extremely important to tell. That will help rid you of your shame. It'll help you to face the truth. Once you've said it, you're going to probably get validated. The person, if you've chosen a compassionate person, they're probably going to validate you. They're probably going to say something like, I'm sorry that happened to you. And so you're going to get the compassion that you need and you're going to feel less alone. And so you'll get the compassion and the support that you need. So and you won't be carrying this horrible, shameful secret. So it, that's why it's so important to tell. And, and with that, yeah. let's take a break and listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. And we'll be right back with more truly life-changing information with Beverly Ingle, author of Freedom at Last. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Beverly Ingle, psychotherapist, expert on childhood abuse, and author of Freedom at Last. So the program that you've put together has these steps that we've discussed so far. Facing the truth about what happened. Acknowledging your feelings. Stop blaming yourself and get angry. And the fourth is tell someone, are there additional steps in uh, with after that? Yes, um, self-forgiveness is very important. Uh, and basically that's connecting the dots between the sexual abuse and the ways you've acted, the ways you've acted as a child and as an adult. Um, there's a lot of acting out that goes on with people who were sexually abused. Um, they're angry. They often get in trouble with the law or they try to run away. They get into fights. That's one kind of a way they do it. Another way to get into trouble is to act out sexually, uh, you know, to be promiscuous, for example. Uh, another way they act out is often to, you know, be really angry with their parents, uh, you know, have problems in the family, 
you know, be yelling and screaming at their parents more than the average teenager. Um, they also act out by doing to other children what was done to them. You know, we know that children do that. They act out what has happened to them. They they acted out with their dolls and their puppets, and they acted out with younger children. Um, and then there's addictions. Very often people who were sexually abused become addicted to alcohol or drugs or sex or gambling. Uh, they, they become very compulsive about something. And so a lot of victims have a whole lot of shame about what they've done. And they need to make a connection between their addiction, say, and the sexual abuse. Once they get that, once they get that, the reason why I started drinking at 12 years old and then became an, an, an addict with drugs is because I was sexually abused. I was trying to numb the pain. I was trying to forget what happened to me. I was trying to wash away my shame. Um, and so, you know, I have to work on my addiction to get better, but I also need to forgive myself for even starting that addiction, uh, especially around sexuality. I have to forgive myself maybe for, um, you know, repeating what was done to me with my younger sister or my younger brother or the kids in the neighborhood. I need to understand that I was acting out was what had done what was done to me. I wasn't trying to hurt them. I'm not a pedophile. I was just repeating what was done to me and acting out those emotions. And so I need to forgive myself for those things. Now that may include an apology. It may include, you know, if you're now married and you and you're an alcoholic or you you're in a recovery program, um, maybe you need to, you know, apologize to the people around you, apologize to your husband, explain to your husband or your wife, explain to your relatives that the reason why you were drinking was because of the sexual abuse. Uh, and that you're, then you want to apologize or make amends, but mostly it's about forgiving yourself, making that important connection between what happened to you and what how you acted out. Um, and that includes self understanding. If you can understand why you acted out the way you did, then you can forgive yourself, which is so important. Um, and another, the last step is to work on stopping behavior today that creates more shame in you, shame inducing behavior. So if you're still acting out, if you become a sex addict, if you're um, cheating on your spouse, if you're stealing, stealing is very common for victims of sexual abuse. Um, it's I've had people describe it as uh, kind of going against authority figures like stealing when you're young, like going to the store and stealing a lot. Um, people have said that, you know, they felt angry at authority figures because it was an authority figure who abused them, a teacher, a coach, a preacher, and they're angry at society and they're angry at authority figures. So stealing from a big store represents those authority figures. So they can get caught up in a pattern of shoplifting. Um, they can steal just even from friends, because it's a way of taking something from somebody else the way their innocence was taken from them. That's really important. You know, they don't, and they don't realize it until we talk in therapy about what's really going on here. You know, why did you steal that bracelet from your best friend? You know, and it then becomes clear that, you know, I feel like important, valuable things were stolen from me especially my innocence. And so I'm stealing back. So the six steps in your program that you describe in your book, Freedom at Last, include, and so this is a summary. Number one, face the truth. Number two, acknowledge your feelings. Number three, stop blaming yourself and actually get angry. Number four, tell someone, a safe person. Number five, forgive yourself. And number six, stop shame-inducing behavior. Yes. Now, Beverly Ingle, Ingle, you're an internationally acknowledged expert on childhood abuse. Did you experience childhood abuse yourself? Yes, yes. What when happened? I was nine. What happened? 
Well, it, it's a long story, but it was a the na a neighbor's husband uh, who was babysitting me, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, a good friend of my mother, uh, it was her husband that did that. Uh, and it went on for a whole summer. And um, unlike a lot of people, I didn't forget it. I have very clear memories, but I don't have clear memories of the actual actions. I have clear memories of leading up to it. He groomed me. He would give me a bath. He told me I was beautiful. You know, I was nine years old. My breasts were starting to develop. He told me I had beautiful breasts. And I didn't have a father. And my mother was a single mother working a lot and didn't have a lot of time for me. And I didn't have any brothers or sisters. So I was alone a lot. So his attention was really important to me. And a man's attention was really important to me. So as typical, he groomed me in the usual ways, building me up, telling me how much he loved me and he was going to marry me when we when I grew up and he'd give me ice cream sodas and and I remember the very first time and what he asked me to do and after that I don't have memories of of the actual actions um but I know it went on for an entire summer until we moved away um and it absolutely changed my life I was one child kind of child beforehand and another afterwards and something very very significant happened that does happen with with children who are abused he he very subtly turned me against my mother mm -hmm. so i wouldn't tell and i was close to my mother before it happened and afterwards i was very distant from her and very angry with her um so it changed my relationship with my mother uh in a very significant way that's very very common and I was one of those kids. Um, I went around my neighborhood reenacting the abuse. Um, what I did was every time I was being babysat by a family and there were kids, I would end up getting us to take our clothes off, you know. Uh, and once we were caught by one, one, one set of parents and I was kicked out of that home and I kind of, you know, spread my bad karma all over the neighborhood in one way or another, either being angry and fighting with the other kids or trying to induce them to take their clothes off. I was obsessed with that. So uh, I was, I had such horrible shame. And the more I couldn't go to a certain house because I'd done something wrong at that house and I had to go to the next house, the more that happened, the more shame I had. I am so sorry for everything that happened to you. Yeah, thank you. And I, that's a lot to recover from. Now, yes. let's take a break and listen to another message from one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. And we'll be right back with more valuable, insightful information from Beverly Ingle, psychotherapist, author of Freedom at Last, an internationally recognized expert on child abuse. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. So Beverly Ingle, psychotherapist, childhood abuse expert and author of Freedom at Last. Um, do you have any sense or what are the statistics about how many children experience se sexual abuse? Well, the general agreement is that it's one in three girls and one in five boys. Um, that changes depending upon who you're talking to, but that's kind of the general agreement. Um, so it's very pervasive. And it's probably, as we all know, it's probably more than that because of, of, of underreporting, because people don't report it. Now you were so brave to share your personal story here at UK Health Radio on the Natural Healing Show. We are on the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. What natural healing methods helped you the most in your personal recovery from childhood sexual abuse? 
Well, grounding is very important. I talked about dissociating. And if you're not in your body, you're not going to be as aware of what's going on with you. You're going to be disconnected from your feelings, your emotions, and that's going to get in your way of healing. So grounding is very important. And as I mentioned, victims very often get in the habit of dissociating, even when they're not being triggered, or even when they're not you know, being reminded of it somehow. Uh, it's just kind of a natural state of being. So getting back into your body is very important and grounding helps you with that. Grounding, basically, a lot of people know this, you put your feet flat on the ground, you take some deep breaths, you clear your eyes. What I mean by that is people who are dissociated often are kind of fuzzy. They're kind of, their eyes are kind of faded out. Uh, so you clear your eyes look around the room and notice colors and textures and shapes and keep breathing and keep feeling the feet on your ground, fit, fit your feet on the ground, and you'll soon re feel different. You'll feel more present. You'll feel more connected to yourself. And so grounding is like the first thing. Then you can do that check-in exercise that I mentioned, where you check in with your feelings your anger, sadness, fear, shame, slash guilt. And you begin to really every day do a check-in, ground yourself and then ask yourself, am I feeling angry? And then I feel angry because, and write that exercise out, write that I'm angry because of this or angry because of that. That will help you to start noticing your emotions. And the third step to that is to after you, figure out why you're angry. I'm angry about this and I'm angry about that. Then you ask yourself, what do I need? <laughs> so I'm angry and what do I need or what do I need to do about that anger? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't need to go eat a pint of ice cream, okay? That's not really self-care. What do I need to do to take care of myself is the, is the full question. Um, maybe what you need to do to take care of yourself is to express that anger. Sit down and write out the anger. Write about who you're angry with and why and get that anger out. Or go put your head in the pillow and scream, okay? Or go out for a drive somewhere and where you're not around anybody and scream. But get your anger out. And the more you can get your anger out at the perpetrator, the healthier you're going to become. So those two things, the grounding and the check-in, are very, very powerful ways of helping you to connect with yourself, get in your body, and that will help with your healing. Great information. And I'd like to add for our audience some other ideas about how you can grant. Go barefoot, garden, Physical mm -hmm. exercise, especially mind-body exercise like yoga, tai chi, and qigong yes. that helps you connect your mind, body, and spirit together. Exercise that works together. Physical exercise, yes. right? Um, noticing when you're full. A lot of people who are disassociated, they eat and then they don't know when they're full. So paying attention, listening to your body signals, right? Absolutely. Right. Um, yes. a, another big thing that I think is so helpful for grounding is creating a safe space in your home, because mm -hmm. as you are aware of Beverly Ingle, people don't heal until and unless they actually feel safe. So yes. doing what you need to do to feel safe. So that could include having a security system, making sure all the locks on your doors work. Right. Yes, yes. Those are great suggestions. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I, I remember a friend of mine telling me this story about how she was um, sexually abused by a family member and growing up. And she went to her mother and asked her mother to put a lock on her door. And the mother refused. And the mm -hmm. mother said, no, we don't have locks on doors in this house. So someone who's been abused, again, that need for feeling safe is at a primal level. And yes. so noticing where you don't feel safe and mm -hmm. taking the steps to feel safe as safe as possible. So creating a nurturing home, everything you can do to sort of feather your nest 
so that yes. you can feel safe and fully comfortable at home. Right? Yes. And I just want to add that if you if you're an adult and you don't feel comfortable in your home, um, then look at, for the reasons why. Maybe it's because you you're afraid someone's going to break in. But maybe there's something in your home, especially in your bedroom, that reminds you of the abuse. Um, and if that's the case, maybe you need to turn your bed a, in a different direction. Uh, maybe you need to change something in the room because it somehow reminds you of the sexual abuse. Um, maybe you need to even change colors in the room. So there's lots of ways that you can be triggered and don't even realize it. Um, you know, if there's something that reminds you of the room where you were abused, make sure that, that you're not replicating that somehow unconsciously in your home and change it. That's part of feeling safe is to feel comfortable in your own home. Yes. And, and that brings me, I'm so glad you brought that up because as a medical intuitive healer, one of the things that I frequently look at is triggers. So what is this trigger? It's any stimulus that you're, you're either consciously or unconsciously aware of that puts your mind, body, and spirit back into the sensations of when you were abused. So right. this could be subtle things such as smells, right? Mm -hmm. Shapes of buildings, places, <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to Montana, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> so for our audience, can you give us some ideas or what are common triggers that you find when you're working with your clients that bring yeah. up these memories? Well, as you mentioned, they can be sights, smells, of uh, touches. They can be any kind of, of sounds. They can be any kind of sense memory. Uh, it's very common for smells to be a trigger. I've had lots and lots of clients who, who are triggered by certain aftershave lotions that men wear. Um, you know, being in an elevator and next to a man that's got the same aftershave, that wears the same aftershave as your perpetrator, you know, can be a huge trigger. Uh, triggers can be something on TV or something in a movie. It doesn't have to be the direct connection doesn't have to be about child sexual abuse. It can be about some of something else happening that was similar to what happened to you uh, growing up. Um, a trigger can be the look on somebody's face who who's looking at you and is shame, you know, shaming you with their look. Um, it can be a certain touch. The, the last step that we talked about in terms of shame inducing behaviors. Uh, we didn't go into it, but sexuality is very important. Um, a lot of survivors are unable to engage in certain sexual acts or, or have certain parts of their bodies touched. So if the molester um, did not penetrate, but it was, it was always about touch and foreplay, you might be able to have intercourse just fine, but you can't be touched. OK, you can't have your breasts touched. You can't have someone touch your vagina. Uh, you could just want to go straight for intercourse. Um, sometimes it's the opposite. Um, you know, the, 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 you can't have intercourse because that was the primary or you were raped. And that was the primary way the, the molester uh, abused you. Uh, but you can do everything else. So if you may have a strong trigger, if someone tries to touch First of all, you might have a strong trigger if someone tries to touch you, period. Okay. If someone puts comes around and puts their arm around you or comes stand behind you, a lot of victims have a startle reaction when someone comes from behind and says something to them. You know, they'll go, ah, they'll scream. Um, so you can be triggered by a certain touch or a certain approach, a certain gesture, a certain look on someone's face, um, a certain sound. There may be certain music that is reminiscent of that time period uh, or that was actually on while the molester was was abusing you. Uh, it might be something like a sunset. When I was being abused, it was often at sunset because that's when my mother was at work and he was taking care of me at night. So at sunset, the molestation happened. And so for years, 
I became very depressed at sunset. People were going, oh, come and look at this beautiful sunset. And, you know, there was no way I could go look at a beautiful sunset uh, because the shadows reminded me of the abuse, the darkening, you know, the sun going down. So it can be just almost anything. I suggest that people begin a, a triggers list, that they begin to write down the triggers that they know. Again, it's connecting the dots. You know, when they, ha I have a strong reaction when this happens. I have a strong reaction when this happens. So if they can begin to write down, you know, I'm triggered by certain smells. I'm triggered by a certain time of the day. I'm, I'm triggered by a certain touch. I'm triggered by movies, you know, make a list. And that will help explain your behavior, which is gonna help you with your shame. If you understand, self-understanding is so important. Uh, the statement, it's understandable that I blank because of the sexual abuse. That's so com self-compassionate and so healing to understand why we are the way we are. Just really fabulous information. Now, Beverly Engel, the author of Freedom at Last. So your six steps, and I'm repeating for our audience again, facing the truth. And I love having a truth book. So you write down what you remember. And I love that your suggestion about triggering triggers list, noticing when you really feel off, acknowledging your feelings, stop blaming yourself and get angry. Tell someone safe, a safe person, forgive yourself and stop shame inducing behavior. Now of all these steps, what steps do you feel is hardest for victims to tackle? Well, it's kind of a toss up. The telling yourself the truth can be the hardest in the beginning, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have real clear memories, or especially if the person that molested you is someone that you loved or respected, you know, a respected teacher, a respected preacher, um, your grandfather you know, that you adored. If it's somebody that you were close to, it's very hard to come to terms with it and acknowledge what really happened. Uh, so that can be extremely difficult. And if you don't have real clear memories, that can make it dif more difficult. Uh, but stopping blaming yourself, I guess overall is probably the most important. That's, that's the biggest obstacle to healing um, is the victim's tendency to blame themselves. Um, you know, as as we know, children's brains are not developed properly yet, and they tend to be very egocentric, meaning that they always think it's their fault. Uh, then on top of that, there's the molester who is very, very manipulative and suggests to them that it's their fault uh, because, you know, they were enticing or they did something. I had a client whose father actually said, well, I wouldn't have molested you if you hadn't sat in my lap at three years old and squirmed around so much, you know, and he believed that in his sick mind, he believed that she was at fault because she squirmed around on his lap. So that's how pervasive the idea is that it's the victim's fault. Uh, and the idea again in our culture and in practically every culture that a victim brings it on herself, you know, um, children do not, bring this on themselves, no matter what. It is never the child's fault. That's so important for a child who was abused to get and an adult who was abused to get. It was never your fault. You couldn't have done anything differently. Boys have a really hard time with this because males in our culture are raised to believe that they've got to be tough and strong and that they should have fought him off, okay? So obviously if they didn't fight him off, they're either weak and a loser or they wanted it, okay? And a lot of males go through a period where they question their sexuality. Why did he come on to me? If it was a male on a male, why did he come on to me? Why was he attracted to me? Is there something about me? It's all about the self-blame. It's all about, I shouldn't, shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have run away. I shouldn't have gone back. We know that kids go back to the molester. They want the attention. You know, they want the love. Um, they want the soda pops and the video games and the candy. And kids are not old enough to, to realize, for a kid, candy is the most important thing. They, they, they are not old enough to understand 
that that can taking that candy and going back there and taking that candy is going to damage the rest of their life. They don't understand that. They don't understand the consequences of that. Uh, so stopping blaming yourself is huge. So Beverly Engel, great information. Now, what I found in my 29 years in natural healing is that often people are somewhat aware. They have vague memories that something unfortunate happened. But what I remind people is you have to develop the inner strength in yourself in order to have the strength to actually face the truth of what happened. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love your steps. You know, the first step being facing the truth, but often people they've got to, they've got to feel safe. They've got to feel secure in themselves and they need to develop the inner resources how, in your opinion, can people develop the strength to face the truth of what happened to them? Well, that's a really important question. It's at, it's not a simple answer. And you probably have some suggestions for how to develop inner strength. What I always do is I always encourage um, clients to remember what they've already survived. <laughs> remember, you know, they often have survived a very tumultuous life without the sexual abuse. You know, they've often survived divorce or child abuse in other ways, or a mother who was absent or a, a father who was unloving and unaffectionate. Um, so what have you already survived in your life? Maybe you've already survived some physical ailments. Um, you know, you survived uh, being bullied in school. You know, what else have you survived and help them connect with the strength that they have to have survived those things. Great information. Uh, Beverly Engel, final question for our audience. Is it important for people to actually remember what happened in order to heal, in your opinion? Yeah. No, again, you may not, you may never get what we think of as a memory, okay? Mm -hmm. A clear picture in your mind and, and a memory of all the details. You may never get that. Uh, that's why the truth book is so important. It may be feelings you have, even vague feelings. It may be being uncomfortable around a certain person. Um, it may be because uh, that person has been arrested for child abuse in, for uh, with other children. Um, you know, and then you realize, well, I was around that same person all the time, and I have these vague feelings. Maybe that's enough confirmation for me. So you may never get a clear memory. But triggers are memories, okay? Mm -hmm. Flashbacks are memories. So, you know, honor those triggers, honor those flashbacks. I always tell clients, flashbacks feel horrible and triggers feel horrible, but they won't come until you're ready. That's the inner strength part too. Most people don't start having flashbacks unless they're really ready to have the memories. So memories may come in different ways. They may come in your body, they may come, you know, your body start, I have clients who start itching in their genitals or they start having pain in their genitals uh, or they can't be touched in certain areas of their body. Those are memories, okay? So reframing it, it doesn't have to be a clear picture memory. It may be a smell, a sound, um, a, a trigger, a flashback, something happening in your body. Those are memories too. So you need to honor those. Great information. You've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been Beverly Engel. You can find out more about her and her wonderful work at beverlyengel.com and healyourshame.com. Beverly is the author of Freedom at Last. Thanks so much for listening. And if you have been a victim of childhood sexual abuse, we encourage you to have compassion for yourself and to give yourself time to heal and know that you can heal yourself and heal your shame naturally. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to the Natural Healing Show. Keep it natural with the Natural Healing Show.